Hello everyone, welcome to Vindasta's weekly webinar. Today we're going to talk about how to sell digital advertising to different industries. My name is Thiago Neris and I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Marketing Services here at Vindasta. With me today is Mike Vossen, who is a Product Growth Expert for Digital Ads. Mike has eight years of experience in the digital advertising industry and today he will help you sell digital advertising services for five different industries, real estate, professional home services, automotive, retail, and medical. Before we start, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll cover them at the end of the webinar. All right. Thanks everyone for attending and I appreciate the intro there. Yago, thank you for that. So, you know, today you guys, as, as was outlined, we're just gonna talk a little bit about some of the top five verticals that you might wish to sell digital ads to. And of course, this is not necessarily a I would say a hard recommendation. Uh, this is more just prescriptive knowledge to allow you to sell, I would say, smartly to these different verticals, understanding their, their unique pain points, understanding where we can uh, you know, help them with an ad campaign. But of course, the fundamentals of advertising that I know we've covered in some previous webinars are gonna be really important. So if you haven't had a chance, take a look at our YouTube channel or our resource center, because we have just a pile of resources in there that you'll find quite valuable. All right, well that said, uh, let's do a quick overview again one more time of the benefit of digital ads. So with digital advertising, unlike other legacy media, of course, you know, it's, it's still a very valuable part of a business's media mix, but it allows us to do some unique things that you might not be, uh, you know, might not necessarily have access to with some of those, uh, I would say, more traditional media types. So predominantly, this is uh, the measurement of success or the results. You know, of course, it's great to have the scale and the scope or that, you know, increase your brand awareness or get a, say, a good share of voice on a search or get, say, some really cheap cost per thousand, you know, ads going out there. But the goal is to have measurable ROI-driven results because at the end of the day, a strong click-through rate may be indicative of a campaign uh, having success, but it is by no means a hard, um, you know, I would say it's a, not necessarily a hard result uh, through a click-through rate. You know, you want to track things that actually matter to today's business owners. So we'll utilize digital ads, uh, as I was mentioning, for that, say, brand awareness, could be used for more sales, could use it like, a, you know, we always say it's kind of like a drone strike, not a carpet bomb. You know, we're targeting a specific audience. We're really getting defined in who we're trying to reach that message with. Where are they? What do they look like? All those kind of factors. Of course, all of this will lean into the hard, uh, or the higher, excuse me, ROI, because we're able to really hone in on that audience. Whoever is most susceptible to say an ad message or to a specific creative, well, we can figure that out in usually pretty short order to ensure that you're only spending dollars on the audience that we know based on the data is going to convert. And of course, we're gonna use all of this to adapt our strategy so that every day and every, you know, say every month of delivery, we're getting smarter and smarter, making uh, it so that your dollars stretch even further. So I'll always tell clients, listen, you know, with a digital ad campaign, that first month is gonna be a lot of learning. But once we've learned a little bit about who your audiences are, maybe your primary, secondary, or tertiary audience, then we're gonna adjust our strategies a little bit. Maybe adjust the devices we're serving ads on or the sizes of the creative or the audience. Uh, all these factors are at our disposal to make sure we're uh, serving the smartest campaign uh, for your clients. So without further ado, I wanted to briefly kind of phrase today's discussion in the general picture of a customer's buying cycle. So of course, digital ads does a really good job of promoting conversion, does a really good job of kind of addressing any one of these little mixes or any one of these pre-built categories from awareness all the way to advocacy. However, it's really important to consider it's not the only medium that we can use to try to promote our brand's message. Awareness can be helped through not only ads, but through legacy media, through some of the, uh, the tools that we'll employ, like social marketing or social posting, listings, all these kind of tools will lend themselves to your customers uh, returning a better result from their ad campaign. I always say it's kind of like you built the foundation of your house with your good listings, your reviews online, We'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, but if you've taken care of all these foundational pieces, advertising becomes quite easy and quite affordable for most businesses. So we're gonna look at predominantly the conversion piece today. We're gonna talk about a little bit of sales strategies for each of these verticals, but I really wanna keep everyone's mind focused on, you know, there it's a multiple step approach to a really robust uh, campaign or even just to profitability uh, for any of these clients. 
they should be, at least in some uh, shape or form, be addressing their awareness, findability, their reputation, all the way to their conversion, and then post-purchase conversion, or uh, post-purchase uh, purchase advocacy, excuse me. So that's definitely something that, you know, we have over 200 products, I believe, that'll speak to any one of these steps in a customer buying journey. But enough about that, let's cut to the meat and potatoes for today's discussion. Let's jump into our first group, which is going to be real estate. So I get a lot of these um, calls, I would say probably anywhere from eight to 15 a week, usually with a realtor uh, discussing a mortgage broker or a realtor's uh, brokerage, how to promote real estate ads, whether it's for users buying, users selling, whether it's promoting software to realtors, whether it's trying to hire realtors, you know, there's the, you know, the list goes on and on. What I've noticed predominantly with real estate agents and with realtor campaigns is that a lot of the time, I don't feel as though we're maybe considering a user's typical buying cycle. So unlike a pizzeria, if you're looking to say advertise for say a realtor, you know that the, the term of that say ad campaign should somehow mirror a customer's purchase journey. So like that pizzeria I was mentioning just briefly earlier, you know, if you're going to look to buy a pizza, it's going to be something you're going to do in maybe a few minutes. You're not going to spend two months researching who has the best toppings, who's the best price. You might, but I highly doubt a lot of people will. Whereas with a house, it's the largest investment, uh, almost, you know, uh, largest investment rather you'll probably make in your lifetime. So do we really expect that one user seeing one ad in the course of say a one to two month campaign is going to not only become a cold prospect, but ultimately become a warm lead or a converted lead for that realtor within that tight, tight time frame. And more often than not, what we're noticing is that a lot of these real estate campaigns, say on like a three month minimum, while they start to perform really well nearing the end of the, the campaign term, what we notice is that we're leaving a lot of leads out on the table because we're not really following them the way they would normally make a housing purchase. So maybe you're interested in buying a home, well, if that's the case, it might take you two to three to six months until you ultimately find a realtor you're comfortable dealing with or say moved into that new home that you had purchased through that realtor. So I always tell any of my real estate clients, we should start thinking about these campaigns in six month terms. Or I would even take it to the business owner. How often on average will you take a new lead or a new prospect from your business, ultimately have them in a home? Or maybe it's, you know, how often from the time someone starts to look at getting their mortgage, uh, well, they become a client of yours if you're a mortgage broker and ultimately then able to, uh, to purchase that mortgage through you. So let's always try to consider the typical buying cycle of whatever good or service that we're going to be advertising for. Of course, that second point is also very valuable. We have to also consider that there's a large lifetime value of a client whenever it comes to real estate. So we know that, you know, say the average home price is somewhere uh, north of say 350,000. Well, if that's the case, does it make sense if I want one to two new house sales for that realtor client to maybe run a $500 campaign for the potential uh, value of you know, anywhere from 1.5 to even maybe greater million uh, as far as that home sale? Well, probably not, right? Again, for that pizzeria example, a $500 campaign is probably going to do really well because the cost of one pizza might only be anywhere between 50 to uh, 50 to be probably a pretty pricey pizza, but 30 to say $50 for that, uh, for that pizza. So let's always consider that large value uh, or high lifetime value of a client. Lastly, I do like to point out that there is a, a scarcity issue whenever it comes to people buying homes. You know, while there is an Apple audience that's interested in purchasing homes, other realtors are aware of that as well. Same with mortgage brokers, right? They know that they have a large lifetime value of a client. They understand that each client is going to be worth quite a bit to them, somewhere to the tune maybe of $200 even per lead, because if they end up closing that lead, they're going to make a commission check somewhere, again, probably north of five to $8,000, right? So if they're looking to generate a really strong return, then I want to make sure that we're really kind of putting the efforts in that ad campaign and we have an ample budget to do that. So I rarely recommend minimum spends on real estate campaigns. I also rarely recommend a minimum term. So six months, maybe, a, you know, depending on the goal, right? Thousand plus, probably a good place to start, depending on the market, depending on the availability of those audiences, of course. Lastly, real estate agents and mortgage brokers do struggle sometimes as well in just their ad messaging. As we 
you know, it's an intangible good. So it's not like you can discount someone's house. It's not like you can promise them, you know, 50% off their mortgage uh, or the rate that they pay that back at. So we know that we have to sell on something else. Can't simply be a buy get. You can't discount it at all. You need to look at how do I sell an intangible good? Well, if, you, if anyone on this webinar has watched a few of our others, they'll remember kind of the fundamentals of a strong ad message. Let's revisit those quickly. First, it's expertise or trust or pedigree, however you want to call that. Why do I trust that real estate agent? Maybe they've been around longer than anyone else, or maybe they on average can sell your home for X above normal market value. Well, that's valuable and I know they're an expert, so now I trust them, I might be willing to do business with them. We're still missing the last two components of a strong ad message though. What's the value proposition? Or we could also call this the opportunity cost. So take that real estate example, Say that realtor on average, right? No hard numbers, but on average will sell your home for 5% uh, above what the normal listing price is. Well, what does that mean to the typical consumer? Maybe not much, but if I phrase that as, well, average housing sale is X. So if I sell your house on average for 5% above market value, that would mean you would be saving, say 50,000, $35,000 in the sale of your home. Can you afford to go with another realtor that's not going to get you that $35,000 on average, right? Well, wow, that's a lot of money. It means a lot more to me than a percent value. I know this is an expert. I know there's a clear opportunity cost now. The last stage in that ad messaging is the urgency. How do I get them to take that action today? So maybe you say, listen, you know, as that realtor example again, Maybe you say, you know what, I don't like to overload myself. You know, I like to make sure I have all, you know, the ample amount of time to do my due diligence for my clients. So I'm only accepting two new home sellers or two new home buyers this month. So you have to reach out to me today to become one of my, say, you know, one of my clients. If that's the case, you know, then I clearly understand this person knows what they're talking about. I clearly understand the value of that action, whether I take it or not, 35, 50,000, right? And I know why I have to take that action today. So expertise, pedigree, or, you know, or trust, I guess you could call that. Then it would be the value proposition, and then it's the urgency. So let's keep that in mind when wherever we're making these, uh, say, real estate campaigns or these mortgage broker campaigns, let's talk about what do they bring to the table and how does that benefit a customer? Because I can assure you there's a lot of people out there simply advertising on, I'll buy and sell your home. Lastly, digital ads allows us to target that audience. So again, it really kind of depends on the person you're trying to reach. Maybe I'm looking for someone who is uh, in a foreclosed home because I like to buy those. Or maybe I want to target users that are in high, say, uh, high household income neighborhoods because I like to sell, you know, multi-million dollar listings. Well, we can target those audiences based on any one of the thousands of data points that we'll use, whether it's income, language, area of the city, um, based on the houses they're looking at, based on the type of financing they might need, based on, you know, just a, uh, just a pile of factors. But we really want to hone in on who that audience is and what are we trying to get that audience to do. So when we look at a typical real estate campaign, what you're showing in, uh, on the screen in front of us is a live campaign. So basically what we'll notice is that usually they'll be selling these anywhere from, you know, 500 being the lowest, and we do have a few of those. However, normally $1,000 and up seems to be the going rate. And consider everyone, this is retail spend. So these are from our reporting platform. Uh, all the numbers you're uh, seeing on the screen are based in retail. So this is what the end user is paying. So in this case, this campaign's been running uh, for quite a while now, a little over eight months, I believe, or a little under, rather a couple, uh, seven, six, seven, eight months. And what we're noticing is that if I were to look at this just based on the click-through rate, well, geez, that campaign's not very successful. 0.33%, that's a fraction of a percent, Mike. I'm not getting a lot of return from it. But when we consider how many people are actually then taking that call to action, engaging with that realtor, and we can see that the value of one new customer for this real estate brokerage, this is a large agency in Miami, um, has about $11,000 value to customer. That means that even though I generated only 20, 222 leads, the real value of that to the business owner is upwards of $4 million, right, in the value of a sale. Important to note that this client, knowing that real estate is a very competitive market and search can sometimes be pricey for those verticals, this uh, client is running predominantly Facebook and display. Um, so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we have about 203 physical visits to this dealership, or this uh, brokerage, excuse me, because we're tracking physical foot traffic. 
And we're also tracking all the calls. So I had 203 visits and I had about 250 plus calls to this broker. Important to notice that in the last week or so, about 20 of those calls have gone unanswered. So those leads aren't even counted. So really, if we were counting every one of them, we'd be somewhere to the tune of 200 and what is that, 56? I would say inbound leads instead of 222. But of course, we're gonna scrub the ones that they never connected with. So really important, again, you guys recap, high lifetime value of the client, very competitive markets means we need to have a healthy spend and we need to have that spend mirror a typical buying cycle of a user. That'll be probably anywhere from maybe six to 12 months would be best practice here. And again, you guys, if anyone has any questions on these verticals, we'll have some time following today's uh, discussion to kind of hash those out a little bit. So throw them in the chat and I'll make sure I address them before the end of the day. All right, moving forward into the next vertical, let's talk professional home services. So this would be things like your HVAC clients, your disaster repair companies, anyone who's got to come into your home and perform a service. So what we've noticed with this vertical, and probably everyone on the webinar will agree, this is a very reactive vertical. When you need it, you need it, right? You got a leaky pipe in the basement. I'm probably not gonna take two months to think about that, assuming I own that house probably, because uh, there's gonna be some damage done by it. Or maybe my window's broken, so I need someone to come in and do a quick repair or an estimate on what that might cost. So what we know with these reactive verticals is it's really not worthwhile to potentially explore things like search, or sorry, excuse me, you definitely wanna do search, uh, social or display because those two mediums are more concerned with how someone has behaved in the past in order to target them with an ad today or moving forward in the future. Whereas search-based advertising is based on what are they asking for today. And if you've ever watched my Becoming an Ad Expert videos, you'll know this is the primary difference between push and pull-based marketing. Search is very much so pull-based, so it's a great spot for almost all professional home service verticals. The one thing I do want to mention is that with a home service vertical, you're always concerned about their reviews online, what people are saying about them. What we've noticed in people's or users' search patterns is they'll find a provider, they'll dig into will the provider be able to handle my problem, and then the second step they do before they even contact that provider is they'll see what people are saying about them online. Of course, no one wants to get you know, a shoddy uh, repairman in to fix their electrical. No one wants a plumber that has a poor track record or customer experience uh, with their previous clients. So that's extremely important, you guys. I've seen a couple campaigns fall flat despite a high, uh, I would say, number of leads being generated for the business if they haven't taken care of their reviews, if they haven't ensured that that business owner has a really positive view in their local community. And as I was alluding to, being as this is a very reactive vertical again, you see uh, home services uh, predominantly running search campaigns uh, almost always with a heavy amount of call extensions uh, or call only ads. So these would be ads served uh, predominantly to mobile users that are looking for disaster repair men in, you know, disaster repair companies, excuse me, in my area or HVAC repair near me. Those are very, very common searches. In that case, it's a race to the top. Wh whoever's at the top is usually going to get that first call. Sometimes it could be said that you're in a you're more advantageous place to be in the second or third position as you get less erroneous clicks, more qualified leads. But, you know, that's sometimes, uh, you know, I would say on a case by case basis. So really heavy in the call tracking, very, very much so ensuring that we are at the top of that Google, uh, say, search page or that Bing search to ensure that you're getting a high volume of calls. And again, consider the fundamentals of strong marketing message so that ties back to those three I was discussing earlier pedigree, uh, value prop, and urgency. Um, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, everyone, but free in-home estimates will not do very much, you know, so I, I can't, <laughs> I don't even know if I can put a number on how many clients have tried to uh, showcase a free in-home estimate. That's kind of like a realtor saying they'll buy and sell your home. It's kind of expected. So you got to think, well, what is my entry-level product and how can I entice this audience to book with me? So maybe it's that, listen, I'm going to offer you X percent off your initial service if you call, you know, um, you know, if you call this one provider. Or maybe it's that, listen, if you're uh, using my services, I'll uh, cut you a deal on whatever hardware I might need to install. Just consider what that messaging might be. Maybe it's just talking about how your client can fix a job or, you know, be on site within a half hour of receiving that order. All of these messages can be very effective when targeting this very reactive audience. So we have quite a few of these as well. And what we notice is that the spends don't necessarily have to be, you know, extremely high. 
That said, it's going to help you with a larger search budget, especially in those larger demographics or in those larger, say, uh, areas where there's a healthy amount of population. What we see in this case, this client, I believe, is extending into about their fifth month, if I'm not mistaken. And we're taking a very conservative estimate of about $2,000 value of the customer, and they close about 25%, that results conversion piece, of the business that we bring in. So when we look at this one, this is an HVAC client. Um, what we're seeing is that predominantly search-based ads, um, somewhere to the tune of, I think, a little over 100 calls driven in to the, uh, to the client. Of course, when he's on, on site working, he can't take those calls, so we're only charting about 49 leads right now. But that said, I would say that we're doing a pretty good job with about 1,600% uh, ROI, uh, based on a minimum spend as well, right? 500 bucks, it's not a lot of money to start advertising, especially considering how much money you're gonna make off one qualified lead. So again, recap with professional home services, let's consider the reactive nature of the clients. When you need it, you need it. So it's not gonna be something you're really gonna run on search, or uh, keep saying that, apologies. Uh, it is something you're gonna run on search, not something you're gonna put on a social channel or on display. Lastly, let's consider word of mouth, reviews, your community goodwill. That's gonna be a huge determinant in your client success. If they got great ratings online, you're naturally gonna get more business and our ad campaigns will perform significantly better than if you have poor reviews online. It can still get you leads, but we're gonna lose a lot of those leads as soon as they figure out that you're a one out of five star, say, uh, uh, you know, um, HVAC, say, supplier, or you know, any of those verticals, disaster repair, et cetera. Jumping into automotive, now we did a webinar a while back on Facebook Dynamic Auto Ads, which is a very, very, I would say, advantageous uh, offering for automotive clients. However, I'm going to look at automotive like a typical campaign here, and we're not going to consider those Facebook Dynamic Auto Ads. <clears throat> we're going to look at this um, as just any, any automotive client out there looking to do any style of marketing. So I, I come from auto, <clears throat> I did quite a bit of work with them in the past, and what we've noticed is that, and certainly what I know, is that Automotive clients know their numbers inside and out. They know their close rates, they know uh, the costs, they know their average cost per acquisition or lead. So they're very, very concerned in the data. How much leads are you getting me? What's the quality of leads? What's the cost per lead? And they have multiple ways to quantify that. So let's consider, say, take the US last year, the average MSRP on a vehicle sale was about $33,000 or a little larger. An auto dealer will normally know the cost per acquisition of generating one phone call, say to the one of their sales staff, to book a test drive online, how much it costs them to drive traffic, say through the door, uh, how much it costs them to do more referral-based marketing. You know, auto dealers know this inside and out, in my experience. So what we'll do is we'll track each of those actions. So I'll look at, well, you know, you have a 33% chance, uh, or 33, sorry, thousand uh, uh, value of a sale on average, right? And if I know you close 20% of the inbound calls, I'm gonna put that into the ROI reporting. I'll do the same for test drives booked online, physical visits, say, to the dealership. I'll even look at, <clears throat> say, those users that are you know, interested in, say, one maker model, <clears throat> excuse me, and request, a, say, a pricing on that or submit for internal financing. All of that will get built into ROI reporting. So we'll have a very granular view of which of those traffic sources are generating the best cost per acquisition. What I like about auto is they're almost always open to new concepts. So it's consistently it's kind of keeping up with the Joneses. What I used to do, you know, as I back in the day is I would, you know, sell one type of campaign to, you know, my one auto dealer, my, my, you know, my, my one guy on the other end of town. And I'd flip then right after that meeting, I'd run to the other auto dealer on the other side of town and say, Hey, you know, we're trying this out with your local competition down the road there. It's looking like it's going to be pretty promising. If you'd like to be competitive here, you know, this is something we could talk about. So that was just something I did. Um, these guys know, you know, these automotive dealers rather know that they're going to be very, very competitive with one another and they have to be current when it comes to advertising online. So they're almost always very, uh, I would say, uh, I would say eager to try out the, the shiny new toy as it were. Like I was mentioning, very analytical and data driven. So they're going to want to know, you know, how much are you generating for me? How much is it costing me to generate each of these leads? A lot of that can be done through the client's Google Analytics. Some of that can be done even through our reporting that we'll provide you. Of course, there are some certain stipulations when it comes to advertising for an automotive dealer um, based on their primary marketing area or PMAs, um, as well as brand guidelines. So I know when I used to run ads, say for Ford, uh, for Lexus, for Bentley, 
you know, any of these clients, they have specific brand criteria that maybe the dealer should be aware of. Sometimes they don't. Uh, there was definitely some instances in the past where I'd have, you know, Mercedes Benz reach out and slap me on the wrist, you know, to say, hey, this ad doesn't follow our brand guidelines. So sometimes with auto dealers, your, your, uh, you know, your hands are somewhat tied on where you can serve the ads and what goes in the ads. But the nice thing about that, though, is for a lot of these auto dealers, they're eligible for what's called co-op advertising or co-op sponsorship through their main brands. So I always used to run up the chain, try to get as many of the major brands to, to pay for as much of the advertising at a local dealer level as I could, because for the auto dealer, that's free advertising. And for us as advertisers, that's a lot more data because there's a lot more money going in the system. So if I'm serving $10,000 worth of ads, I'm going to get an insight 10 times faster than if I'm serving $1,000 worth of ads. That means that campaign ramps up dramatically. You cut your learning curve, you know, in 10th, I guess. Um, and we're able to generate a positive ROI that much sooner. So very typical auto campaign. Again, we know that it's uh, not as long as a house, but there is a longer lifetime value uh, or uh, run, typical buying cycle. We know that the value of a customer is extremely high. Um, we also know that, you know, based on, you know, the relative competition and how often users are searching, you know, this is a pretty competitive vertical. We know just about every auto dealer was one of the first movers on digital ads was the automotive uh, verticals. So this is a campaign that's been running, geez, you know, I don't even know how long we're in now, a year and some. Uh, this client has been one of our, I would say, larger automotive dealers in Eugene, Oregon. Um, this one's doing just about everything. This is predominantly Facebook and search, what we're looking at here. Important to note that, again, even though 152 leads are charted here, they actually generated well over 200 calls to the dealership, uh, at least 12 hours of talk time, greater than that probably. And their search campaign, where it's at today, I believe is almost about a 7% click-through rate. So depending on where you pull your benchmarks, that's either two to four times greater than the average. Their average cost per click, even on a retail level, is about five bucks. So when you think about, ooh, geez, cost per acquisition, hey, would you pay $5 for a potential sale of 33,000? Ooh, you know, I'd make that deal any day. And this is just looking at our standard Facebook standard search offering. Uh, if you've uh, watched our Facebook Dynamic Auto Ads webinar, you'll know that we're basically generating a wholesale cost per click of, I believe, a little, little around $1.30. So that's extremely advantageous to auto dealers. These are verticals that have deep pockets. They're willing to try things out, but you're going to live and die by the numbers. So this is something we definitely want to... Uh, kind of work through with a fine tooth comb. Because if the numbers don't look good at the end of the month, you know, we're out on the street. Jumping uh, gears slightly, what's my time at? Oh, I'm making good time. We're gonna talk a little bit about medical as well. Now I wanna consider medical not only say doctors, not only physiotherapists, but also things like medispas, things like dentists, chiropractors, any medical vertical. We get quite a few of these as well. Again, similar to those other verticals, high lifetime value of a client, um, you know, maybe a little longer buying cycle, but not too long. You know, if you, if you need a doctor, you need a doctor, but you also don't want to go to some guy, you know, some quack who's got his degree from, you know, University of Phoenix online, right? You want to have someone who actually went to a med school. One thing that's very, very important with medical verticals is legal requirements. So some of us on the line might already be aware of things like HIPAA. Um, you know, that's Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. That's for our U.S. partners. Of course, in Europe, it's concerned with GDPR. So that's the General Data Protection Regulation. That's predominantly for EU and mostly has to do with data collection on a website versus on an ad. But there are some disclosures that need to be made and there are some limitations in what we can track. And of course, here in Canada, it's uh, PIPIDA or PIPIDA. That's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Uh, we're a little wordy more than our American and European brothers. Um, but again, all of these, I would say, uh, pieces of legislation are in place to prevent um, you know, the unlawful use of someone's personally identifiable information or electronic health information. This means that in a lot of cases, there are limitations in what I can track. Call recordings, physical visitations, um, even some lead capture you know, will come under scrutiny. And it's something that is, you know, always a concern to us when we run these campaigns. So we're not able to give as much insight, legally speaking, you know, because we're prevented from doing so, doesn't mean we can't run a really strong campaign. However, important to note that, you know, any of these kind of criteria on what you collect, what you don't collect, 
normally I would say addressed at the partner and client level. Uh, of course, all our ad offerings are compliant, HIPAA, GDPR, and PIPIDA or PIPIDA. Uh, but that said, how you then collect the information, say on your client site, will be the responsibility of that client, yourself, or their webmaster. But what I like to always talk about with medical verticals is to focus on entry level procedures or services. So if you're a dentist, well, probably a good idea to talk about new patient cleanings, right? Versus getting someone in to do an emergency crown, which can be, again, still a valuable, I would say, uh, service that they provide, but it might not be your, uh, say, primary entry level service. Maybe you're looking to poach clients. Well, if that's the case, maybe don't use your entry level, use what service or, uh, uh, say, service, yeah, service makes sense, they're not product. Use whatever service you're trying to uh, take uh, from your uh, local competition. So if I know that I do say those emergency crowns, 30% cheaper than the three other dentists in my immediate area, maybe what I wanna do is target ads exclusively in those three dental areas or in those three dentists' offices to target their audience to say, hey, listen, I do this service for about 30% less. Downside is I can't tell you how many users from those dental offices then walked into yours, which I could do with a normal retail or, or anything that I wasn't legally required not to. But unfortunately, as we know, considering the legislation there, I, I won't be able to give you the visitation data. We can certainly talk about how many of those users, though, clicked engaged on that ad. Of course, with dentists or any medical vertical, it's very much so educational-based selling. A lot of the times, again, you can't really discount your service. Maybe you can. Um, but in some cases, it's simply about educating that audience. So are you looking to take a cold audience and tell them about your treatments? Did you know laser hair therapy or laser hair removal could be perfect for you if you have X, Y, or Z factors? Say you sweat a lot, well maybe laser hair removal is something you should consider. It'll help keep you cooler, you're not gonna sweat as much. What I'm trying to do there is educate a cold audience to start considering what we would call the unconsidered need. So didn't know I might need laser hair removal, now that I'm educated that it'll help me remove, or help me prevent, uh, prevent me from sweating rather, might now maybe it's a service that I want. So a lot of the times, if you're not gonna do a discount on say one of those entry level products or procedures or services rather, then you would go to educate an audience as to why they would use your service. So it kind of depends. Are you looking for those ready to convert leads? Maybe you discount your service. Are you looking to develop a new audience that might have an unconsidered need? Well, then it's education-based selling. So you want to talk about all the good things your medical clients are doing in their area, their experience, video-based ads work really well for these guys, um, certainly something I'd consider. Lastly, we do have to consider, again, targeting and creative will be somewhat restricted due to sensitivity of uh, the nature of the, the ads we're running. You know, we, a lot of times we get things for like uh, cancer clinics, uh, things for you know, reproductive health clinics, any of that kind of stuff. A lot of the times there will be limitations on what we might run as far as targeting as well as creative. Um, and then lastly, privacy. So again, very concerned with not collecting a user's uh, identifiable personal data here because you know, we're gonna get, yikes, I, I don't think I, I'm ready to be subpoenaed. Um, you know, it just doesn't feel like something we wanna do right now. So let's consider that as well. So sometimes the data might be limited, but really valuable audience indeed. So what we're looking at here, I believe this is a dentist in New Jersey doing a heavy amount of search and social. Um, what we're noticing, again, very similar to these other verticals is they have, uh, yeah, they're going on to what, their seventh month now it looks like? Uh, no, finishing up their third month rather. Um, they have a high lifetime value of a client. If I was just looking at the click-through rate again, maybe I might not be overly impressed. Even those leads where we see 69 leads, well, it's valuable, but how many did we, you know, is that really strong considering a $2,000 retail spend monthly? Well, actually we generated well over a hundred calls for this, about four, hour, four plus hours of talk time. Uh, and I believe we were advertising more competitively, uh, targeting their local competition with a new patient special. So saying, hey, did you know, you know, uh, Dr. Mike over, you know, on the, down the road doesn't do, you know, he doesn't do this service, say veneer whitening. If you come in and become a new patient of mine, I'll knock 30% off. Uh, you know, a veneer whitening treatment after your first visit, right? So through that, we've generated quite a few, uh, I would say, leads. We're counting 69, close to around 70, but we've had, yeah, well over 100 calls to this business, and who knows how much web traffic. Looks like quite a bit, considering the clicks. Last topic I wanted to touch base on today is your traditional retail. So these are very, very difficult to define sometimes, because it could be anything, right? Shoe sales, 
uh, could be, hey, heck, now it could be things like um, medical marijuana, uh, you know, dispensaries, though we cannot do that for the record, everyone. Uh, Facebook, Google will not allow us. Um, could be basically any retail, traditional brick and mortar type business. And what I find a lot of the times is these businesses are already doing a little bit of, usually a little bit of everything, or if they have a limited budget, they might be doing some radio, some TV, some print. So let's consider the business's media mix. Do I want to come in and uh, say compliment the, the media that they're already running? So if they're doing branding through maybe their TV spots or radio, uh, do I want to maybe focus more on engagement online with their brand or conversion ultimately when a user is interested in their product or service? Or do I want to try to bolster what they're currently doing? So maybe they're doing some good awareness through their paper or through their local print state or radio station, excuse me. Maybe I can bump those numbers up and then really offer what we would call a multi-screen marketing campaign. TV, desktop, tablet, cell phone, right? Of course, with e-commerce, there's just about any conversion point under the sun. You know, you might look at users tracking calls, say coupon redemptions, uh, e-commerce purchases uh, would be something that we can definitely track. Of course, it's all done online, that's what we love. Visitation data even, tracking users physically navigating from their direct competition into their actual store, and I can track users doing that. What I have noticed though, uh, almost always, is that most retail businesses really lack insight into their audience. For the most part, while they have a really good idea on who's coming into their store nine to five, they might not know who is their online audience. Well, this is an area that I feel all of us, you know, can offer some additional uh, assistance with our business and make our, ourselves a more intangible part of their, their business is to give them that insight. So if you guys have ever heard me in the past, you know I'm a big believer in, in becoming either Google Analytics certified or at least gaining access to the back end of your client's sites where possible, because that makes you an intangible part. They're not gonna get rid of someone who is giving them real world insights into how people engage with their brand online. Having a website and not tracking how users engage with it is like opening a store and not putting anyone on the till. You know, how are you gonna know if people are coming in? How do you know what products and services they're looking at? Entry exit pages, pages uh, per session, session duration, you know, looking at bottlenecks. What's the user flow? Do they come in and look at your pricing right away? Do they come in and look at that one, red, uh, say, pair of red shoes that you're selling? Or do they jump in and look at testimonials? This is really interesting insight that you can use not only in the online advertising world, but through their legacy media. So if I know, hey, your online audience isn't say men and women 35 plus, it's actually uh, say men between 18 and 25, well that's probably gonna change how you do your advertising, not only online, but as well through those legacy efforts. Lastly, I would say that you know consultative selling is a must with traditional retail businesses. So talking to them about, well, what other marketing efforts are you doing? What are you trying to generate? What are some areas you feel could be improved? How can I help you basically? I find a lot of the times people will sell retail in a very stock or standard approach. You need a $500 search campaign or you need you know, a $500 say social campaign and I'm gonna you know, generate leads for you. But again, you know, retail business, uh, you know, business owners, he or she is interested in not necessarily where those ads are going, they're interested in their business and the day to day making sure that their, their door is swinging and their tills ringing, as we say. So, so we want to make sure that whenever we launch one of these campaigns, we're addressing what areas are, say, um, you know, lacking, how can we improve them, or we're looking at what is this business owner really looking to generate? Awareness, engagement, conversion, and in what form do they want that? So let's keep, keep in mind, almost every business should be done in a consultative, uh, I would say, um, you know, every campaign rather should be sold consultatively. That said though, I find with retail, it's especially important because really, you know, you're, you're kind of their everything in this case and they need your expert advice. So let's not just, you know, sell a package to them just for the sake of it. And lastly, again, you know, this, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but let's consider the fundamentals of that strong marketing message, right? Pedigree expertise, um, value proposition uh, or call to action, and then ultimately urgency. So re retail businesses know they can discount products, they can talk about coupons, they can talk about limited time offers, they can do just about anything under the sun. They have a lot of autonomy on how they structure their offers, mostly because they don't have much oversight from say a, a headquartered office, you know, it might be just a, a one-off mom and pop shop. Well, they have basically uh, full reign on whatever ad message they're gonna run with. 
So let's build some really, really strong ad messages here. And that's going to go a really long way in re returning a strong, I would say, ROI. So this is the women's clothing brand, I believe, running on Facebook right now. You know, we're generating a really good return for this. Uh, this client's been running quite a long time, it looks like. Um, again, you know, looking at the amount of leads we're generating, well, you know, 185 is, is strong, but actually that's just online purchases. Really, in, you know, when I'm looking at the numbers, I have a little over, a little under 1,300 users hitting their site. The remainder are going to a landing page for an offer um, of that 16, uh, 600, sorry, 13,000 users hitting the site from the 16,000 clicks. You know, I had about 1,300 people adding items to cart for ultimately about 185 purchases. Important to note here, because I haven't integrated the client's e-commerce platform, like their POS system, into our report, that campaign revenue is not a dollar for dollar, you know, X many sales. We just know that the average value of sale is 500, and I've generated at least 185 sales that are directly attributable to our ad campaign. So if someone goes on there, maybe leaves for a day, comes back and makes a purchase, I can't track it, or there's ways I can, but you know, it takes a lot of setup. So for the most part, 185 is a conservative estimate on how many sales we've made uh, directly attributed to our ad campaign. Of course, attribution is very, very, I would say important when it comes to any ad campaign, but a lot of these actions get done offline as well. So we have to sometimes look at them uh, with a little grain of salt. So again, kind of a recap for today's discussion. We always talk about it, you know, just the number, you know, three quick tips on how we're going to do this. And I know I've hammered this, so I'll try to be quick on this. The number one determinant of a campaign success is that offer, you guys. Doesn't matter where the ad's going. Doesn't matter how much money we're putting behind it for the most part. It can help. But really, what's going to generate a positive ROI is the value prop, the clear call to action, um, and as well, that urgency. So why do I trust you? What am I getting? Why do I need to do it today? There is no set price. You guys have heard me say this a lot, I'm sure. Really, any budget generates positive results. Oh, I shouldn't say that. It's possible for any budget to generate over, you know, really positive results. What I always say is, for a $500 campaign or a $5,000 campaign, the larger spend will simply cut down our learning curve. Again, just law of averages, right? If I'm serving out 10,000 ads versus 1,000, like I was mentioning earlier, I'm getting insight on who engages in what medium, what time, what device that much sooner, meaning we can optimize or change the targeting that much quicker for you. So it just means we'll learn, you know, the systems are smarter. And lastly, it's understanding your clients. But I find something I had to add to this slide just before we jumped on was to also communicate success. I find a lot of the times, you know, some of our partners might just feel the report will do its own job. It'll speak to the success of the campaign. But again, you know, like I was saying, these businesses are looking for you to be their trusted marketer their marketing expert. So to not only give them a report that's going to say, hey, you know, we generated, think of those past reports, you know, 12,000% ROI. But here's some insights into the people who are calling you. Looks like no one's picking up. I lost 40 calls this month because no one picked up the phone. So is that something that maybe we should address? Or let's look at your site traffic. You know, 85% of these new entrants from this ad campaign went to this one product or service. Well, that's interesting. Maybe we should consider advertising that one product or service on the next go with this ad campaign. So let's keep in mind that that success is understanding your client's ad objective, understanding who their audience is, and lastly, that typical buying cycle. So if we're considering all of these things with any one ad sale, what we'll learn is that you're generally going to have a long value or a a long run on that ad campaign. It'll be low maintenance because you've already set all the expectations in the initial sale. It'll make my life significantly easier and therefore your lives are all significantly easier and you know, it'll just work better for everyone. So with that said, you know, last thing I wanted to touch on is that of course, Vendasta can handle all of these pieces for you. This is some of the stuff that we'll look at whenever we go to launch an ad campaign, you know, as you might know, we're doing everything from search ads, display, Facebook, local ads, uh, which is a rebranding of our tracked ads, if you're familiar with that. And of course, video-based YouTube campaigns. So if you're interested, you know, feel free to reach out, you know, we're more than willing to set some time and chat about that with you. The last thing I did want to quickly touch on, I've been forgetting to do this in my last webinars, but Google, because we sell so many uh, search ads, Google's actually granted us a uh, search coupon basically, 
any $150 of search spend in the first month uh, will get up to $150 additional search spend added to their campaign. So I believe this is the most I've seen around there. I think the, the next highest I've seen is $125. So very, very happy to bring what I believe is the, the, the most, uh, the largest rather Google coupon out there. So any new search campaign uh, that any of our partners bring us to manage and run is going to have that $150 of additional search spend added to their campaign, assuming we spend $150, which is safe because we always, with a minimum of 500, uh, you know, spend at least that. So just something to consider you guys, some, some good reasons why you might choose to have us run your ad campaigns. And lastly, the last little promotion here, and then I gotta take some water, I'm gonna lose my voice. Uh, we're doing a, a promotion right now for all basic partners. So before you would need either a higher level subscription or an add-on called marketing services valued at about $1,000 in order to have fulfilled ad campaigns, social posting from our teams, listings uh, and review, uh, say response generated from our teams. But for right now, for digital advertising exclusively, we're gonna allow any basic partners from now until the end of August to run any ad campaign fulfilled by our team in-house at no additional subscription. So what this means is if you launched an ad campaign, say even August 30th, if you ordered an ad campaign, that campaign can run in perpetuity as long as you basically want it and you don't have to upgrade your subscription at all. Also a great way to test out our services before maybe upping your sub. I understand that you probably don't wanna dive in two feet first. So this gives our basic partners a nice kind of sampling of what they might expect if they choose to up their subscription level with us. So definitely something I would consider taking advantage of because after August 31st, geez, that's, a, I would say, a minimum $1,000 of monthly subscription, even, to, say, to launch an ad campaign with me and the team. So just something to consider. So that said, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Um, of course, we're going to have some, uh, some good discussions on this, I'm sure. And no, everyone, this isn't the last series on uh, vertical-based selling. We'll be coming out in a couple weeks or a month. Who knows how long it'll be, but we'll be doing another one on some other verticals as well. So any suggestions on verticals you'd like us to cover, uh, please feel free to send those uh, and then we'll make sure we address them on a later webinar. Dave asks, uh, dental treatment sections on dentist websites are largely ignored. Any suggestion to rectify this? Great question. So what I always suggest in that case, uh, David, is to have either richer content. Text is a little dull sometimes, right? If I'm reading about a crown, you know, it's kind of a little dull. That said, maybe you don't want to see a video of someone getting a dental crown. Animated video, though, explaining the procedure or talking about exactly what benefit your dental uh, provider can offer could be very valuable. Potentially, it's also just about driving the right traffic there. So maybe it's something like site link extensions in a search campaign. So someone searching for, say, dental crowns goes directly to the dental crown page. Ideally, on that page, they have text outlining the technical breakdown of the procedure potentially some cost, but you could also hide the costing behind a lead capture form, like submit your name and number, and I'll give you the, the rough price on you know, a dental crown. Great lead generator, right? You could also consider putting some rich media or some video-based content in there to engage the audience, because it can sometimes be somewhat of a dry read, right? But that's a great question. Tara's asking, based on Vendasta's minimum spend and setup fee, how is she going to make money on a digital ad campaign? Really, truth be told, you know, everyone on the, on the conference line, I'm not going to beat in price. You know, you could find probably, you know, hundreds of other agencies that'll do this for cheaper than I do. But what they can't talk about, though, is the performance, right? So we have like an 87% retention rate month over month, as we saw in all those examples I was showing you of live campaigns. The vast, you know, almost every one of them, I believe, uh, has renewed double the initial time, if not triple. Uh, so they're in there for a long period of time, which means even if you take a smaller margin on the monthly wholesale, which will be my suggestion, uh, is to upcharge whatever I'm charging you, upcharge it so you're making a margin. If I keep that client in the system for 12 months, 24 months, that means each month you're simply taking a margin on it and you really don't have to worry about the heavy lifting. We'll produce the reports, we'll do all the optimization. You can simply go out and find new clients to sell to. Our average ROI right now, I believe, is a little over 530%. So I know we do a really good job of generating a return for a business. So I would say we're, uh, I would say a safe ad offering. You can find some cheaper providers out there that let you get a higher minimum or a higher margin, excuse me, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to retain that business. Consider as well how people view ads. Predominantly, digital advertising is an entry-level product uh, for our clients. 
And even for our partners, about 80% of our, our signed partners come in part due to the digital ad offering. So I would consider it as your entry level product so you can get clients in the door and then sell them the other services and products that you're known for. Alexander asks, how can I learn about the numbers? How to calculate the ROI? Does Vendasta have any articles to learn numbers better? Great question, Alexander. Uh, if you jump on our YouTube channel, Becoming an Ad Expert Level 1 talks about how ROI is calculated. There we go. Long and short is I'm taking the amount of leads by the average value of a customer by the results conversion or close rate. So if we think bed mass, you got a bracket there, bracket there. Basically, I'm saying 80% of $500 times 185 leads to generate my revenue and my ROI is a percent. So if the, and again, consider the business owners are providing all of this to us. So they'll say, listen, you know, I, on average, this clothing retailer sells $500, say per client, seems to be the average. And they close about 80% of clients coming into their uh, shop or shopping online, which I highly doubt online, but maybe. Um, so we'll take all of that to calculate ROI. So it's indicative of what they might be generating. Not necessarily, I would say, a true ROI, because I'm not, unfortunately, standing by the till counting how many users bought from our ads, but certainly something to keep in mind. Let's see, Jeremy. If we have a cost per lead, not CPC agreement with the client, what's the best way to structure an ad spend with Vendasta? Great question, Jeremy. I am fervently against pitching cost per lead or cost per acquisition. The reason for that, again, is because I have no control over the offer, uh, the call to action in the urgency behind it. So if you told me, listen, Mike, I need a cost per acquisition or a cost per lead of $20, but I'm going to give you total disclosure. Like you're going to have full autonomy. I'm a car dealer say, well, no worries. I'll make that agreement with you, but no, I'm going to sell your trucks and cars for 50% off the uh, MSRP. So that $33,000 vehicle now becomes $16,000. If they buy today, I can generate that cost per lead for you. But are you going to be happy with me? Probably not. You just lost a lot of money. So I'm very, I would say, um, personally, uh, I know some people like to pitch CPL or CPA. I'm very against pitching on a return because there are factors outside of my control uh, and outside of your control as well, unless your clients are giving you full discretion with their, uh, their ad, um, uh, I would say with their ad messaging. The, way, the best way to structure that is to simply tell the client, be forward with them and say, listen, I don't have the ability to make your promotions. I don't have the ability to ultimately make a sale for you. You know, I know they're not calling me when they're interested in those cars or those, uh, those shoes, say. Uh, so, you know, I'm not willing to enter into a CPL or CPA discussion on the performance of the campaign. I can benchmark and show you kind of the rough, I would say, average on what we're generating. However, I would say pitching on that is, in my opinion, a recipe for, for disaster down the road because the day you don't generate that CPA or CPL is the day that campaign concludes. Uh, and we're not uh, getting that business anymore. Tara asks, this is a white labeled service, correct? Totally correct. So important to consider with digital ads specifically, uh, there is no communication between say my coordinating team and the end client. All communication is funneled through the partners. Of course, the reporting is completely gray labeled, can be white labeled. Um, of course, all communication being routed through your sales uh, staff. So, hey, here are the proofs that we built for you. Give us revisions or what do you think? Here are the landing pages, you know, here's some codes that we need the client to place on their site. All that communication gets coordinated through our marketing strategist or our media strategist, excuse me, and the primary salesperson on the account. Alexander asks, can I bring clients concerns to Vendasta so they can advise me on what to offer? Sure can, Alexander. So we have a success on demand team that's very well versed in ads. Any really tricky ones usually come to me uh, and I can certainly help you with that. And for a lot of our new partners, what I'll even offer is uh, to potentially jump on a few calls with them. So if you need help selling, hey, I have no problem coming in white labeled as Mike, your digital guy, I work for you, right? So if you have clients that are really tough or you're like, oh, I just have no idea, they're peppering me, or maybe it's my first campaign and I'm really kind of nervous about it, hey, feel free to book some time with myself or our success on demand team or your assigned uh, uh, partner development rep. Certainly between us, we'd be able to help you out there. And ultimately, I'm more than willing to jump on a few calls as well to kind of help you make that sale. Alex also asks, um, can you walk us through the client onboarding process once they've signed on? Great question, Alex. Predominantly done through an order form submitted online. So I want a Facebook campaign or I want a search campaign or I want a display campaign. What you're doing is you're jumping onto the platform. You're going to order that through uh, that business, through the activate product section, like you would order any other product. 
It's going to have an assigned order form to it. So say search, it's going to ask you what's the goal of the campaign, what's the wholesale spend, what I'm charging you, what's the retail spend, what you're charging the client. Then it's going to talk about what's the value of a customer, what's the close rates, yada, yada, yada. For search specifically, it'll start asking things like, well, what products or services are you looking to showcase? What keywords do you want us to start doing the research on? We'll do all the heavy lifting, but I need help at the local level on what makes this business special, what makes them different. Those three main marketing, I would say, points to a strong message are fleshed out through that order form. Once that coordinator has picked up that order, they'll be reaching out to you for you know, clarification, creative proofing, landing pages, code placement, all that kind of stuff. And then usually from the moment that that's picked up by our team, we have a SLA or turnaround time, about 10 business days. A lot of the times that can be shorter. Uh, the main delays are usually uh, on the partner level, just getting you know, creative back or getting confirmation that a campaign's ready to go live. Once we've got that, everything's in place, we're ready to roll. Um, what'll happen is basically we're gonna launch that campaign on our end. And as far as billing is concerned, you're gonna be charged uh, the entire wholesale monthly spend, uh, usually one to two business days prior to the campaign launching. So we front load billing, important to note, I strongly suggest all of our partners doing the same thing. It's going to really hedge your bets against uh, going out of pocket on any one ad campaign. Oh, Alex, uh, Alex asks, where can we get tips and advice on the keywords to go with? Great question. Think about using your client's Google Analytics. So analytics will actually tell you what search queries drove organic or paid traffic to your client's site. Know that our team has a couple thousand dollars of keyword planning tools, of market research tools that we'll use to look at the keywords that we're going to run with. I would say if you are just looking at a general level, concentrate on the keywords that that business owner wants to be known for. So again, if I'm that dentist, maybe I want to talk about my more entry level services, teeth cleaning, teeth whitening. I know that the people getting dental crowns or getting dentures are probably going to be lifetime value clients of mine not necessarily someone coming in fresh as a new client to get that service done. So I'm probably going to want to concentrate on more of those entry level services or procedures. So if you had say a, you know, one, three, nine, 20 keyword groups, each keyword group with maybe 30 to 60 keywords in it, we're not charging by keyword. We don't charge by keyword group. Uh, but let's try to keep it focused on what are we trying to generate um, awareness for? Oh, so I have an anonymous attendee asking, how are sales meetings uh, scheduled with my prospect when my prospect wants a specific time to meet? Great question. Usually through a lot of back and forth. Uh, so I have a Calendly meeting for all our basic partners, the ones I can run ads for. Um, we can use that Calendly meeting. You can set a meeting in your local time and then invite the client to it. And we can use a white labeled uh, call conference line. Um, other than that, a lot of the times it might be just a little bit of back and forth. Keep in mind on a typical campaign, there are no monthly update calls. All communication is done through the coordinator to the salesperson. The SMB is actually not included in that communication. The goal here is to make our partners the heroes. I'm not trying to cut anyone out of a, an ad sale. And if a client knows, hey, geez, I could just go direct, which Vindas would never do, as you all know. But if they know, then they would try. So we keep all communication through the partner. So usually I leave that on the local salesperson's time. Alexander 10 asks, what percentage can I resell the service for? 100%, 200%, don't want to price myself out. Well, that's some lofty margins, Alexander. I would say I have clients marking up the wholesale 100%, make no mistake. I would say the typical markup appears to be anywhere from 10 to 25% of the wholesale spend. So, you know, whatever I'm charging it to you for, you might find it, you know, advantageous to keep it closer to the lower end wherever possible just because it's your entry level product for a lot of your clients. Hey, listen, Mr. Business Owner, I'll run your search ads, but in a couple months, once I've proven a positive ROI, I wanna talk about your SEO work, or I wanna talk about how I can help your listings or update your website. You're gonna make a heavier margin on those products almost always, they're less competitive, and at that point, you've already earned the trust of that business owner, so it's easier to then sell them other products or services that could complement their ad campaign. Tara asks, so with the service being free for the basic level subscription until August 31st and no charge for any ongoing campaign, can we add money to the campaign after August without having a pro or would that be included in the service? Great question, Tara. You certainly can. The only thing I'll stop you from doing after August 31st, you won't be able to activate any new campaigns. So, hey, I'm running a Facebook campaign for this business. Now I want to run a search campaign for them. Unfortunately, you'd have to upgrade your subscription then. Also, if you pause that campaign, say for six months and then wanted to start it up again, 
well, you know, if it was maybe one month, I might be able to cut you a deal, start that up again for you. If it's six months though, sorry, you know, at that point, you know, it's so far out since we last had it live that we're going to have to basically build a new campaign. You would need to upgrade your subscription then. Alexander 10 has got another one here for me. What are the most prolific ways to get new clients when starting out? What does uh, Vendasta recommend? Long and short, you're just like a service vertical, right? You can't discount your products for the most part. You need to sell based on your pedigree, expertise, uh, knowledge. You need to be able to establish trust with them. You need to be able to develop a clear value opportunity or value prop, uh, you know, or, or value in the ad messaging and lastly that urgency so I strongly recommend businesses who are looking to advertise themselves start doing some local stuff organically at first join a local business group talk about how you know I know partners take things like our blogs they'll pull stats out like did you know if you don't have a mobile optimized website 85% of your traffic is gonna bounce usually in the first two seconds 85% of your traffic that's huge can you afford to lose 85% of your traffic because your website's not up to scratch did you know here, you know, at Alexander Tan Industries or, you know, at Alexander Marketing Group, you know, we specialize in mobile optimized websites. Right now, we're offering, you know, maybe a 5% deal on any new mobile website or a free landing page or potentially $150 on a new, say, search campaign, because I'm going to give you guys that, you know, book some time with me here to discuss your, your problems or how we might be able to help run a snapshot tool to talk about, you know, their areas online, they might be suffering, you know, keep in mind, you guys, a snapshot was designed to generate leads for our local partners. That's what its purpose is. It's called the report of pain internally, because its job is to basically poke holes in their online presence and show them where they need help. So all of those things can be used. The last thing I would say is, you know what, do some uh, marketing on your own. So on Facebook, on any of these business groups, you can post ad messages and see which ones resonate better with others. So maybe my local, uh, say, community forum that has more local SMBs like mom and pop shops, maybe they resonate stronger with getting real marketable insights from their ad campaigns. Maybe that ad message in the, just a post alone gets better clicks than the one that talks about redesigning their website. You can start to do some of this A-B testing, some of this analysis early on before we even put dollars behind it. So by the time you're ready to launch an ad campaign, well, I know my local mom and pops are mostly concerned with, uh, you know, getting actionable insights uh, from their online audience. They're not as interested in getting a new website. Well, that's really helpful for me because I won't even bother looking at trying to drive, you know, hey, we build new site ads to them. I'm just going to concentrate on, you know, how our ROI reporting works, how it's very tied, you know, it's, or it's intimately tied rather to them generating return. So consider doing some of the same tactics that we talked about for these other businesses for yourself. Consider doing some of, it, some of it through organic efforts for free. It doesn't cost you much to write a five minute, say Facebook, or to spend five minutes rather and write a Facebook uh, uh, post to a local group. I'd strongly consider that. Dale asks, will Vendasta assist me uh, with producing a 15 to 30 second spot I can run in my market? Unfortunately, Dale, uh, I don't have videographers in market for uh, wherever you're located. Uh, however, keep in mind, we do have video vendors that are able to look at that as well. A lot of the times you guys, a quick video on your phone will do wonders. Video is just a passive ad medium, meaning people don't have to engage heavily to get an ad message. You could run a video on Facebook with closed captioning. They don't even have to turn the volume on. You're still getting your message across. Sometimes a cell phone video comes across as more endearing as well. So it shows you that you're not a big, say big time agency that might not care as much about their local businesses. Or maybe it's that you're that informal digital marketer that's really off the cuff, but you know, likable, charming, all those kind of things. You'd be surprised how far one of those amateur cell phone videos can go. So definitely something to consider or consider looking at some of the products that we might have already in the store. So take a peek at that. Um, definitely some, some items to consider as well. Great question though. Videos are great. And yeah, you definitely want to keep it 15 to 30 seconds. Strangely enough, the average video view we're seeing on our Facebook ads is about 21 seconds. So you want to keep it really short. I used to say 30, 21 is kind of the sweet spot now. Alex asks, any plans for offers available for partners to use book their own ads via Vendasta? <laughs> oh, that's a great question, Alex. Great question. E, you know, you know what? Honestly, Alex, I run a lot of our partners ads for their own businesses as well. So if you're a basic partner or greater uh, and you're looking to run lead ads for your own agency, know that I can certainly help you with that. I got quite a few clients right now running ads for their own agency. So definitely something I can help you with. 
So thanks for everyone's attendance. I really appreciate it. You know, you guys are great. It's the reason why I keep doing these things. I know that's why uh, Thiago uh, manage, you know, uh, gives us his time to build them. Appreciate everyone's questions. Of course, as you know, if you have any other questions, you can always reach out. This deck's going to be available and uploaded on YouTube, hopefully shortly. If you might be aware, we're having Vendasticon down in San Diego. So if you're not uh, there yet, uh, get out there. Please buy me a ticket. I would love to go instead of run these campaigns. But unfortunately, someone's got to keep the lights on. Thanks for everyone's attendance today, though, you guys. This will be up on YouTube shortly. Appreciate the great questions. Until next time, you guys, have a great day. Appreciate everyone's time.